All right, in this video, we are going to go over the cotangent parent function. We are also going to basically connect it to the tangent parent function, of course. Um, if we have time, it would be kind of nice to kind of think of it as the quotient of the cosine graph divided by the sine graph. So not just thinking of cotangent as being cosine over sine, but it's literally, its graph is also the quotient of their graphs. So what happens when you divide the, these outputs in this graph by these outputs in this graph, the outputs being the y value for certain x values. So first things first, cotangent. We're going to treat it just like tangent. We're gonna graph two full periods between zero and two pi because the period of cotangent is just pi, meaning it takes from zero to pi for all of the answers of cotangent to happen. And then when they happen, they're all done. Then what can happen after that is we could, um, we could see um, the same answers repeat themselves between say pi and two pi, okay? So it's still going to have two periods visible when we're done graphing. We're still going to find five tick marks per period being that the last tick mark of the first cycle or the first period is the first tick mark of the next one, or I guess this way I would show it to you, right? First one. So starting point H and then plus Q, plus Q, plus Q, plus Q. That's the end of a cycle. But then we start a new one. So these, this point is the same. And then you keep going plus Q, plus Q, plus Q, plus Q. So you should have nine tick marks altogether nine tick marks altogether, and um, yeah, we're gonna start from there, all right? So let's go into this. Y equals cotangent of X, which is the same as, make sure it's always clear in your head, that is the same as Y equals one cotangent, parentheses, one parentheses, X minus zero, close, close, plus zero, right? So that right there is by default A. By default, that's B. By default, we have H. By default, we have K, all right? So it's not that like, oh, we don't have a B value, worst thing you could say. You do have a B value, it's one, okay? You even have an H value, it's zero, okay? Um, but to not have something is to have zero of it. So I'd rather you say we don't have H, we don't have K, than to say we don't have A or B, because then you have nothing, because zero times whatever. Um, okay, so let's go. So I'm gonna start off this graph by drawing my Y axis. I'm using the same starting strategy as I would for tangent. And the more, maybe you guys have even noticed, the more you spread out the points for yourself, the easier it is to get in there and label stuff. Then here I'm going to, actually this time, what I wish I had done last time, I'm gonna do today. I'm gonna put the one and the negative one a little bit lower on my, or a little closer to zero on my Y axis because um, I think it helps you guys really see the inflection in the graph. And I think that inflection point is really, really important. Um, if you plan on taking calculus. So here's one and here's negative one. Obviously that's zero, whether it's um, the X or the Y of zero. Then X axis labeled, Y axis labeled. My last tick mark is two pi for right now. Somewhere in the middle, I'm gonna plot pi, just so my spacing's pretty good. In the middle, in the middle, we have then pi over two and three pi over two. This should be like second nature at this point. And then one, two, three, four of the other middle points, which are all the pi over fours or the 45 degree reference angles. Um, pi over four, three pi over four, five pi over four, and seven pi over four. And we like those spots because tangent and cotangent will equal either one or negative one. Reciprocals, you do not change the sign. The reciprocal of one is one. The reciprocal of negative one is negative one. Okay, so that's where we are so far. So from here, what we're going to do now is kind of just consider 
the values of cotangent as we make our way around the unit circle. So if we envision the unit circle, again, you shouldn't have to draw this out every single time. Cotangent, we start zero radians here, and we're gonna work our way all the way around. But when we get halfway, every answer we got from here to here, from zero to pi, will repeat itself as we go from pi to two pi. They are identical. So everything that happens all the way to here repeats and happens all the way back till there. And obviously it goes indefinitely in the negative direction, never ends. What's it? No, you guys are too young. The show um, Lamb Chops Play Along when I was little, it was already old. So I don't think you guys know it, but it was like the song that never ends. I don't know if you guys know. And it's just like the same verse over and over and over again. Kind of like that. But this goes round and round in the negative direction forever. And that goes round and round in the positive direction forever. That's why our graphs go on forever. We don't want to graph forever. So we just graph a, a, fit, uh, a fixed little window of it. Okay. Now we talked about tan, tan, meditating man. That's zero on the sides. And it's undefined on top and bottom. Cotangent is the reciprocal, right? What's the reciprocal of zero? Reciprocal of zero is? Undefined. Undefined, perfect. So grabbing a highlighter. Was I using the same color for my vertical asymptotes every time? Does anybody remember? I don't remember. Yeah. What was it? Do you know? I think it was orange or pinkish. Yeah, maybe pink. I know H was definitely pink, but uh, I think it was pink. Yeah, but that was also because with tangent, it was also at the first spot, wasn't it? No, it wasn't. Wait, Miss Thomas? Yeah. I have a question. Sure, sure. So, like, I know, like, the reciprocal is, like, the easier way to graph, like, cotangent. But, like, what I did, like, when I was thinking about it, like, doing tan, it's, like, when we took the unit circle, like, I know it's, like, the same thing, but I was just, like, wondering like is this like where you get it from is like when you do like y over x i just flipped it to do x over y right but we should be at a point a lot of people will do y over x or x over y sine over cosine cosine over sine whatever way you're thinking of it but the problem with that is like by kind of using my stupid little tan tan meditating man method you don't have to sit there and figure out y over x or x over y anymore because like you kind of yeah. will memorize what you need to memorize you know so tan yeah, I, just I just remember like that was where it came from. Yeah, that's where it comes from. But that's like when I always talk about, like, I tutored a girl when she was a freshman in Algebra 1 or something or whatever year class it was. And she was doing 8 times 4. She did 8 rows of 4 dots. And she counted them to get 32. And then after that, I asked her what's 4 times 8. And she did it 4 rows with 8 dots in each right after. So, like, we don't need to be that person, right? Like... There's a faster way. So we just try to, that's where it comes from, yes. Um, but it's just faster. We could be more efficient if we have these little pieces kind of memorized, you know? Yeah, obviously, like, I wouldn't do it, like, when I'm graphing. But, but it's, you know what? It's good if, like, you forgot. If you're in a college class and you're like, oh, my God, my professor's going so fast and they're talking about the graph of um, cosine or tangent or whatever, then you figure it out. And once you do it once and you have that parent function, you're just like, okay, brain, Let's, let's work on remembering what is this graph? What does it look like? And every time I see one like this, I'm going to remember to do whatever, you know? So we just work on memorizing it as best as we can. But whatever you need to do to be efficient, then you do that. Just you want to make sure you're being accurate, okay? Any other question? No, no? All right, I was just checking one of these videos over here. Um, to see what color I did everything. So I'm fast forwarding. I did, for some reason, blue as a vertical asymptote color, but I'm gonna make them purple because I have a good purple highlighter now. I don't know if I really used that before. Pink was my first tick mark. All right, we'll see how it goes. All right, so I'm carrying on. So, um, okay, so we said cotangent is gonna be undefined on the sides. By undefined, we mean, like Catherine brought up, the reciprocal of zero, essentially, or cosine over sine. So over here, cosine is one, sine is zero. Anything over zero, except zero over zero, 
is undefined. So undefined on a graph will look like a vertical asymptote. That's our caution tape and it's saying you can't go here, not allowed. So it's undefined right there, but it's also undefined right over here. That's at pi and two pi. Undefined, again, vertical asymptote. That's where sine is zero. That's where y is zero. That's where the denominator is equal to zero. So we have a vertical asymptote at those places right over there. And I'll just kind of go over here. I'm gonna kind of color code. I'll write down underneath this highlighter color um, what we're gonna do from there. Um, all right, so then I'm just gonna mark this. I'm gonna say that meant undefined, which translates graphically into a vertical asymptote. Okay, there we go. Now, over here, if you were to pick another tick mark, if you were trying to remember this graph and it's like you're in your future and you're talking to future self, what would you maybe do next? We just said to ourselves, okay, cotangents undefined at zero pi and two pi. We put that on our picture. What would you do next? Any ideas, suggestions? Well, if it's undefined at the inverse of uh, you know, the reciprocal, the reciprocal of zero, then it's got to be zero at the reciprocal of the asymptotes on the tan graph. Right. So normally tangent has undefined here and here, which gave it vertical asymptotes at pi over two and three pi over two. So cotangent is going to equal zero at those spots. So I believe I used maybe a green marker or something for that. I'm trying to look at the pictures and the colors, but not too sure. So I'm gonna make that my zeros here, here. So I'm gonna put zero. And by zero in parentheses, I'm gonna put um, on the, I don't wanna say x-axis, because if your graph moves up or down, obviously it's gonna move up or down with it. So I'm gonna put um, sinusoidal axis. So it's on that dashed line if we move things up or down, all right? So those we said are at pi over two and three pi over two. So here's pi over two, and here is three pi over two, all right? What else can we add to our picture? So if we only had that, okay? If we only had that, those same classic five tick marks, do you see how that's not enough information for us to really be able to draw our graph? And based on what tangent looks like, if you have your notebook open, tangent is like a scoop going up like this, right? You know, it's like increasing kind of shape-wise. We agree. So if tangent has that shape, a lot of people are gonna go in and they're gonna assume and sketch cotangent. But what's something else that we should make sure we consider before we finish up with the graph these little squiggly branches any ideas for that we're sharing that it's one and negative one on the y-axis and we have these tick marks left pi over four three pi over four five pi over four and seven pi over four that's here 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 and here what do we know about cotangent in those places it's one and negative one. Right, and they're positive and negative in the same places. So it's positive one, negative one, positive one, negative one. So one of the big spots where everyone really screws up in this is they draw cotangent the same shape as tangent, right? And they're just like, wee, and they go like that. But that won't be good, okay? Because it is not going to have that same shape. If you think about either the ones and negative ones. Or if I put my hand here, I'm covering. If I think of this zero to pi over two as quadrant one, is cotangent positive or negative in quadrant one? All the trig functions are blank in quadrant one. Positive. Thank you. There's only gonna be positives there. So that's positive one down here, negative one, it's kind of squashing my label, no big deal positive one, negative one. And I used orange 
and a bunch of these graphs kind of show it as like an amplitude type of thing. So it's sort of the same idea. This one and negative one is gonna help us see our stretches and compressions, or at least vertical ones, a little bit better. Now, like I said, I lowered those points this time because it kind of makes it a little easier for you to see the scoop happening in the picture. So there's that. And then here, another little scoop. So this part, from here to here, from zero to pi over two, in between those two places, your graph is concave up. And then from pi over two until pi in between those two spots, your graph is concave down. I'm saying in between those two places and not at them, because obviously you don't even have graph at the asymptotes. And then at this point, we say it's neither concave up nor concave down, because that is where it changes. So that point is known as your point of inflection, an inflection point, point of inflection, okay? So if we were talking about, you know, the temperature outside, right? So it was like kind of warm over the weekend for a little while, right? But then it got colder, colder, colder. So if you see here, the temperature's going down, but it's almost like it's kind of gonna bottom out and we're gonna find a, a minimum the temperature will kind of stop at a certain number, ignoring the y-axis, just shape-wise, right? But then something like this tells you that there's a rapid decline, that it's now it's changing from being slowing down as it goes down that temperature to speeding up as it drops. Like it's dropping very dramatically quickly, okay? Um, this would be wonderful if we could see COVID cases do this, right? New cases, they're, oh, they're going down, going down slowly. You don't wanna see this go down too slowly. We wanna see it go down like this, like rapid. And the opposite, if it were going up, you'd rather see it going up like that than to see it going up like that. So if you see in a graph the inflection point coming, it starts to change. That's usually, depending on what it is, a bad thing or a good thing, depends what we're talking about. All right, so anyhow, that was your little inflection point lesson. Here we have the same idea. There we go. So again, this is like quadrant one, positive. Quadrant two, negative. Quadrant three, positive. Quadrant four, negative. Quadrant one and quadrant three are like twins. They're identical. Quadrant two and quadrant four are like twins. They're identical. One period is right here. Also, thinking back to like lessons 11 or 12. Another thing that we did was um, we talked about the inverse functions and we restricted them to certain quadrants. I know it was a while ago and I know this is something that people tend to like kind of forget, but cotangent and tangent, I drew them with like little broken hearts because they were not negative in the same spaces. So when we were doing cotangent inverse, if it was of a positive ratio, we looked here for all of them. But for cotangent inverse of a negative ratio, we looked here. We looked between pi over two and pi. That's pi over two and pi. So that means for cotangent inverse, the graph is like a reflection the other way, we kind of had this smooth, continuous piece. Tan inverse, we were looking positive ratios for answers that we were looking here. And when we were given a negative ratio, we looked down here, and that wasn't really between three pi over two and two pi. Instead, that was between negative pi over two to positive pi over two. Why did that happen? I'm just gonna do a little sketch down here. T uh, co uh, tangent, 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 had an asymptote right there at pi over two, but it also has one at negative pi over two. This is tangent, okay, quick little mention, I don't know, theta, x, whatever, that doesn't really matter. Um, it was zero right there, it was zero right there, it was one and negative one. So tangent kind of looks like this. If we wanted to analyze tangent as the inverse between the same place as cotangent, then we have an asymptote right in the middle, we have this random undefined piece that we have to consider, quadrants one and quadrants two, and which end do you pick for zero? You can't have both or it's not a function. Remember when it was the inverse, we rotated it over the 
or re uh, reflected it over the line y equals x. Um, so we don't want this piece. Instead, we looked at it between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So again, we have a nice smooth piece. At the very beginning of this, uh, recording here, I told you something that drives me crazy is when people describe cotangent as just negative tangent. But do you see why they would think that, right? Like they see this shape is going up, they see dotted lines, they see curves, and then this one is just like the other way. Okay, but they're not going to have asymptotes um, and the zeros in the same places. The points they do have in common are the, these one, two, three, and four. Only those. Those are the only points that they will have in common. So I don't know how well this pen works, but um, so tangent, you don't have to draw this. I'm just going to kind of throw it on top though. I'm drawing with this little red pen over here on top, overlapping. So tangent will pass through that as well. Okay. And then it goes up and approaches an asymptote here instead. Then it'll go through this point as well. This will be at zero and it will go through that. So it will look like here, like that. And then it'll pass through that, but that'll be a zero. So in red, I know it's a little nutty looking, I overlapped it with tangent, okay? So the zeros, and the asymptotes are not in the same place, but the ones and negative ones are. Those are the only things they have in common, okay? Um, cotangent starts with a C. There's three trig functions that start with a C, so there's three vertical asymptotes. I had something that I said the other day that I helped me remember. I was like, oh, we can remember. This has this many, I don't know. Tan has two, starts with a T. Tan has two asymptotes, cotangent, C is the third letter of the alphabet, and it has three. I don't know, unless you come up with something better. But whatever you have to do to quickly remember what it looks like and how to graph it. Any questions on the parent function's shape for cotangent? Any questions there? Not yet? Okay, so let's just talk about domain and range a little bit here of cotangent. Um, or at least the range. What's the range for cotangent? What is the range? Go ahead. All real numbers? Yeah, it's going to be all real numbers, so you could do that little fancy R symbol, or we can write negative infinity to infinity. Now, it was the same for tangent. Why is it that sine and cosine had a range between negative one and one, and secant and cosecant, their range was negative infinity until negative one included, one included to infinity, but now, so they both had things that we couldn't have, right? It was only certain things, but now tangent and cotangent are all real numbers for the range. Why are tangent and cotangent's output or range all real numbers? Why is the range, why is the output for either cotangent or tangent, both of them. Why is it all real numbers? Why do we have no issues getting an output for those two functions? Anybody want to share? Well, with the other, with the other fractions, like of you know sine over cosine, you couldn't have had them be more than one because, like greater than one or less than negative one, because then it would have messed up tan, and tan can't be greater than one. So that put the limit on those graphs. But why were those, why did those have um, issues with like being greater than one? Why doesn't tangent have an issue with being greater than one? Why is tangent able to be bigger than one and smaller than one? Why is there so much freedom for tangent? What aspect? Think back to like the very first thing of trig you learned in geometry, back to basics. Why you don't have any restrictions on your answers for the ratios for your outputs for tangent and cotangent. What did you first learn in geometry about tangent? If you had a little friend in geometry and they were like, oh, I'm learning so Katoa. What are they learning about tangent? What should be the first thing they learn? Tangent is what over what? 
Jason, Catherine, Elijah. That's not, that's, not, that's, not, that's, not. that's not what you learned in geometry. What did you learn in geometry? I just said the little mnemonic device guy. Opposite over adjacent. Good. It's opposite over adjacent. Okay. If it's opposite over adjacent, apparently that means it could be anything. Why is that the case? What side of the triangle is the one that causes the problems? What side of the triangle is the one that causes us problems and causes us to be restricted in a way? Oh, wait. Is it because, like, like how are we talking about, like, the um, hypotenuse? Like, it has to have a certain length in order to, like, be, like, to connect the opposite and adjacent. So, like, if you have tan, like, you don't have to have a hypotenuse connected. Like, it can extend to all values. Yeah, and, well, yes, and, and basically it comes down to the fact that the hypotenuse in order to be the hypotenuse of a right triangle, it's the longest side. So it restricts whether your fraction, if you have a hypotenuse in the numerator or denominator, if that's got to be the biggest side, well, it's going to block you into being either numbers always greater than one or always less than one in an absolute value sense. So since we're dealing with opposites and adjacents, there's no rule of who needs to be bigger or smaller. The opposite, the adjacent, doesn't matter. There's no rules. So these fractions could be anything. Bigger than one, smaller than one, no big deal. Lots of freedom there. But we'll elaborate on the domain separately. So in the next video, we're gonna do an example of this. Maybe what we can try to do is make up an example that will have no pies on this axis. I think that'll be a little interesting. So we're gonna look at that in just one minute. So if you are feeling kind of confident with cotangent, thumbs up, not confident and think this is nuts, Thumbs down and we're going to do a practice problem next.